She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. I have my arm around this man sobbing over this woman, and all I can say is she's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. July 10, 2004, I'm 30 minutes into my commute. I'm panning the sides of the road for Florida Highway Patrol. I'm speeding. It's 4 a.m., and there's absolutely no cars on the road. There's two hills on the turnpike before it turns off to the 836 at the top of the First hill, there's a sign obstructing the view of the top of the second hill. By the time I got to the top of the second hill, I rear-ended a vehicle going 83 miles per hour. I didn't brake. I didn't swerve. Velocity sending me forward. Airbag and seatbelt kept me in place. My vehicle sliding to a stop until it's facing a totally different direction. There's smoke billowing from the mangled engine. I unbuckle my seatbelt. And I grab my eyewear from the dashboard where it flew to. I put them on and I peer in the direction I was heading from just to make sure no more cars were coming. And I run over to this man who's sobbing, sobbing over his mother. And I said, she's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. She's going to be all right. And she wasn't. Sobbing, hugging my knees, Florida Highway Patrol walks up to me, says, have you been drinking? I had a beer says, we're going to have to draw blood. I have a phobia of needles. I don't do needles. Listen, buddy, we're going to do this one or two ways. You're going to give it to us, or we're going to take it from you. October 2004, I was formally indicted with DUI manslaughter. Three years later, I find myself in court. Jacob Penaranda, I'm sentencing you to 15 years state prison. Upon you turning yourself in February 2nd, 2007, I'm mitigating it to five years prison followed by five years probation and permanent revocation of license. I have 30 days to situate my affairs before turning myself in for five years. Energy in the courtroom is a combination of hurt, nervousness, anticipation, all just swirling around in one big washing machine of past trauma, present judgment, and future pain. I've already served three years in prison for unoccupied burglary and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. This would be my third time serving time. And in this moment, I realized what I have is what I had taken away from Nareda, time. Warren Buffett, the wealthiest person on the planet, could not buy what I had, so what was I going to do with it? I chose to focus on mastery of the spirit, mind, and body as part of my commitment to become part of the 24, the 24% that get out and stay out. And in order to do so, I had to confront trauma, trauma I had created and trauma I had experienced. And that began with the relationship with my father. Son, sit on the couch. I have something I'd like to discuss with you. I move with the uncertainty of an 11-year-old boy, and I sit and listen. Jake, I really don't know how to say this, and I'm not sure you're going to understand this, but I had to tell you before I go, your mother and I are not getting along, and I need you to be strong. I need you to look after your mother and your siblings. Jake, you're now the man of the house. My father left the next day, and I immediately went numb. It's as if I'd, when the emotions came on, it's as if I'd uploaded a very dark and evil strain of malware. My hatred would often turn explosive. My rage would find its outlet in violence. Hatred and resentment would be the foundations of the cell that would incarcerate my soul long before I was in prison. In order to truly be free, I had to walk through the door of forgiveness, a door that I had the key to. And I had to learn to have compassion for my father's journey. In the days following the accident, healing began on my knees in a spare bedroom with my grandmother Magali praying for Nareda and her family. And I asked the Lord to strengthen me mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually so that I might be a light in this world, not add to the pain and suffering. While in prison, I, I began to assess my character and all the decisions that had led to my undoing. I began to shed all that was not in alignment with my spirit's calling. I stopped listening to music that objectified women, that glorified violence, the sale and usage of drugs. I stopped watching TV. I went into my dictionary and I scratched the word hate out. In the same dictionary, I would learn 20 new vocabulary words a week and learn to use them in proper context. I read the Bible cover to cover. It took me 33 months, 20 chapters in the morning, 20 chapters in the evening. 
These were all the preliminary steps that I had begun to align with my spirit's calling. Having initiated that alignment, I knew what was next to embark on the journey of my mind. Jacob Penaranda, I'm sentencing you to 15 years state prison. Upon you turning yourself in, February 2nd, 2007, I'm mitigating it to five years prison, followed by five years probation and permanent revocation of license. I leave the courtroom and now my mind is racing. I will soon walk through these doors again of my own volition, only to leave in handcuffs and ankle shackles on my way to the University of Hard Knocks. Around the same time, my brother was getting prepared to go off to the University of Miami to study medicine. We were both students, we just both learned differently. Between sixth and 11th grade, I was in seven different schools. I finally ended up dropping out of high school and I decided that I was gonna turn these five, five years into my university. So I aggressively searched for schools that would offer correspondence courses and I found the University of Phoenix but they, the courses they offered were not accredited, so I keep searching and I found Louisiana State University. I, on, I end up only taking one college level course because while in prison I had to figure out how to pay a crooked attorney to ship me to a privately run institution where my exams would be proctored because state run institutions didn't have anybody to proctor my exams. If the system was not gonna support the mastery of my mind, I would find a way to do it myself. I became a student of life, and experience became my curriculum. I chose things I was interested in, like being an effective communicator, but not just speaking well, listening intently and connecting. Sales, a natural spin-off of communicating effectively, I became enamored with the art of the deal. And business, a bottom line, and business, not a bottom line business, a purposeful business with a soul-driven mission. Entrepreneurship. Mike Tyson says it best, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Having been punched in the mouth literally and figuratively, prison life prepared me for entrepreneurship. And you can never fail at something if you never stop trying. Psychology, I wanted to get to the root of my actions and that of others. Sociology, a keen understanding of people, their interactions culturally and how this impacted the world. Universal laws. On the receiving end of laws that govern a society, I sought to understand the laws that govern our universe. And finally, self-help. None of that mattered unless I can find and deal with the root of my self-destruction. So I found people I love like Tony Robbins, a man of honor, and I decided to model him because he has the results I seek. I bought his book with a pack of cigarettes while being held at Moorhaven Correctional Institution with, in, in 2008. And in that book, it has the reader outline their business goals, their contribution goals, their toys and adventure goals, their personal goals. And two goals that stick out are one, to attend his program, Date with Destiny, which I completed in 2015. And two, to master the art of public speaking. And here I am. I became addicted to the magic of manifestation. Having initiated the alignment of my spirit, and the journey of my mind, I knew what was next, which was my body. I had always worked out. I was always really athletic. But my motivation had been hatred, fueled by anger, resentment. And having initiated this alignment of spirit and the journey off into my mind, I knew that I could no longer allow these insidious emotions to take residence in my body. So my new motivation had become, become self-love, self-actualization. And I would train until my legs felt like they were going to fall off. I would push as much weight as I could until I felt like I couldn't breathe and I couldn't go one more. Because I knew that if I can push my body to its limit and take my mind along that journey, everything else would have to follow suit. Jacob Penarenda, sentencing you to 15 years state prison upon you turning yourself in February 2nd, 2007. I'm mitigating it to five years prison, followed by five years probation and permanent revocation of license. I have spent one-fifth of my life in prison. I have been punched in the head while handcuffed by correctional officers after spitting on the floor because I couldn't breathe because they got the pepper spray so far down my throat I was bleeding from my esophagus. I've been housed in a six-by-eight cell seven days a week, 24 hours a day for a whole year, only to leave that cell for three showers a week and fed through a flap in the door. I've been pepper sprayed in a shower cell because I refused to go into an, a cell with 
an inmate who I thought might try to harm me. And after the second can of pepper spray, I went. Amidst all the past abuse from correctional officers, the countless fights with inmates, the anger, the rage, the hate, the violence, I chose to focus on love through mastery of the spirit, mind, and body. And what I got was freedom. Freedom from the past. Freedom from the guilt. Freedom from the shame. Freedom from the mental cell. I'm a living testament for what's possible for the 10,000 prisoners that are released a week. 76% of those released today, 7,600 human beings will be returning to prison within the next five years. With 5% of the world's population and 25% of all incarcerated people here in U.S. prisons. What would it look like if our prisons implemented healing and became transformation centers? What would it look like if our prisons were a place of catharsis where men and women were supported in atoning for their crimes to become better human beings? What would it look like if we flipped the statistic and 76% of those released returned to their communities to become pillars of their society, pillars of society? Let's take a look at the Norwegians with 20% recidivism rate, where they believe in turning prisoners into good neighbors through restorative justice and implementing humanity in their, in their Department of Corrections. Restorative justice is a form of criminal justice that focuses on the rehabilitation of offenders through reconciliation with the victims and the community at large. An example of restorative justice, I was mandated to do a victim impact panel course with Jose Rada, the executive director of the Broward Safety Council and Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And I was so moved by the the courage of two mothers, so moved by their courage that I chose to volunteer alongside them. And I've been doing that ever since. I've spoken in prisons with the nonprofit group Proverbs 22.6. I've spoken in high schools with the Dory Slosberg Foundation. It's a 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day job to be one of the 24%. This is what I'm choosing to do with my time. What change will you inspire with your 24 hours? Thank you.